Um, coming up next on the mini masterclass series, we have Dr. Susan Baxter. Um, she's going to be talking about how we can involve patients and the public in literature reviews and why would we want to. Um, so that's going to be our next one coming up in April um, and you can book for that at the link. Andy's just put that in the chat box. So, but today uh, we have uh, Michelle Black. Um, Michelle is a pharmacist by background. She was a pharmacist for 17 years uh, before joining the Public uh, Health Speciality SRA program in 2015 uh, and coming to SHA. At SHA, as I said earlier, she did our Masters in Public Health program, which she now teaches on. Um, and she's currently a research fellow nearing the end of her NIHR doctoral fellowship. Um, which ends in April 23, unless that hasn't, uh, unless that's changed, Michelle. Um, uh, and following that, she'll be going back to complete her public health specialty training. Um, but at this point, I'll just go and check that the slides are there, Michelle, so I can hand over. Okay, I'm just going to switch over to your slides, Michelle, now, and then I'll hand over to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Okay, great. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much, Claire, and thanks for that introduction, and thanks everybody for. Um, coming and giving up your lunch break to come and listen to this. Yeah, so as Claire said, um, I'm just about to complete my doctoral fellowship, which um, I started with the NIHR three years ago. And today I'm just going to uh, explain a little bit about um, the findings from the fellowship and what that might mean for building on best start in life policy, and then offer a few reflections that I've had um, throughout the past three years on this, uh, doing this research. So, okay. So, the challenge is that if you're born, you know, you, if you're born into disadvantage, um, it's very difficult to try and escape. It's difficult to escape poverty um, and the effect of social disadvantage and poverty are pervasive and cumulative. And one of the main um, ways of escaping disadvantage and poverty is through um, education. And I think this um, a scene from this uh, program called Derry Girls, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a, a sitcom about teenagers growing up in the 90s and the troubles in Northern Ireland. And they're waiting for their GCSE results. That's the test you take in the UK when you're 16, and that leads to onward education. And one of them says to the others, we're girls, we're poor, we're Irish, and we're Catholic. If we don't get our GCSE results, we're stuffed. And I just thought that was the perfect phrase that kind of exemplifies how our social conditions determine our future life chances, but that as a, as a societal level and as individuals, we see education as a route to a better life and better life chances. So how does education do that? So um, I use this conceptualization of education for my research, um, and that sees education as a product and a process in the social context. So what that means is um, kind of your social determinants, so where you're born, your family circumstances, the availability of education, all of that determines your access to educational opportunity. So that's the, the first kind of yellow arrow there. Then the type of school you go to, the quality of the teaching, the environment, the process of how you um, develop skills around learning, that's education as a process. And then the product of all of that is your years of schooling and your tests and your academic achievements. Um, so it's education as both the process of learning and how you develop skills and also the product, the things that you attain. It's both of those things that lead to better health as an adult. And we know that that happens via three ways. So having better um, education leads to better, can lead to a better job, which leads to more income into the home um, and better employment opportunities, et cetera all of which is good for your health. Then it also leads to better um, social status, which can be good for psychological well-being, better well, mental well-being, and then also due to the effect that education can have on um, health behaviours. And all of those things is what leads to better health um, as an adult. And obviously health and education are symbiotic over the life course, both um, influencing each other. Um, so my interest is in when and how development or education translates into health in a childhood and adolescence. So the first educational product in countries like the UK is um, a term called school readiness. Sorry, just one second. Yeah. 
And school readiness is just an indicator. It's a composite of these four aspects of development. So a child's social and emotional well-being, their cognitive ability, language and communication, and their physical development. And at the end of a first year of um, school in this country, a teacher will assess a child and decide how um, well developed they are in those areas. And if they meet expected levels, they're classed as school, readies, uh, school ready. And most local authorities in England um, track school readiness and there are gaps in school readiness depending on whether children grow up in more deprived or more affluent areas. And lots of areas are trying, trying to close um, the early years school readiness gap. So we know that school readiness impacts later educational success. So for example, last year there was some research done and it looked at children at age 16 who didn't um, pass their GCSEs. It, then that was one in five children. It tracked it back to school readiness and those children were much less likely to be school ready at age three. And they were also much less likely to pass their reading test at age five. So if you're on an early poor development trajectory, that is really uh, not good for your later uh, academic success as a teenager. Then we've already described how childhood education is good for health in adulthood. That, that evidence is very clear. Um, so good education in childhood is one of the best ways to avoid poverty and uh, poor well-being in adulthood. But there's much less research and evidence about the impact of school readiness on health later in childhood or in adolescence. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's very important because if we don't understand the development health translation in childhood through to adolescence, how can we intervene? So how can we continue after the um, giving children the best start in life and after the whole emphasis on school readiness? How can we continue to support children's development and enhance how that's translated into health? And that lack of evidence base is one of the reasons why there's possibly a policy gap beyond the best start in life. So these are some examples of policies in the UK about um, focusing on the best start, quite rightly, because it's a critical phase of development for children um, and it's their very formative years. But how do we start to build on these policies? So a little bit about why me and why this topic. So as Claire, Claire introduced me as um, my, my the beginning of my career was certainly in pharmacy. And one of my first jobs was in a community pharmacy in a very deprived part of Sheffield. And I remember one day this young boy around five or six walked into the pharmacy, very bedraggled looking, in his school uniform, looking very lost. And um, we brought him into the dispensary. We looked after him. He didn't say very much. Nobody came for him. Um, we, we had to call the police eventually and they, they looked after him. And it always kind of sat with me as that re-emphasis of the very first slide I just put up. Um, escaping poverty and disadvantage is very, very difficult. And the more we can do as a society to try and equalise things for children, um, the better. Then as I carried on in pharmacy, I got much, in, much more interested in the wider determinants of health and in prevention rather than medicine taking. So avoiding ill health in the first place. And one of the research shows that one of the most important determinants of health is education. Um, largely because of the effect that that then has on your income. And I think as a society, it's interesting about what we expect of the education system and do we use the education system in its full potential to break intergenerational inequality. So the most recent, recent social mobility SAR in the UK, she said quite recently, the education system is broken because it keeps poor children poor. Um, and that's quite a profound statement and people will agree or disagree with that. But there's something I think quite fundamental um, that most people think that that's quite true. But we don't fund education to look after all social ails. We fund it to teach. So that's a question for politicians, policymakers and the electorate, really. But that's another discussion. Then my other interest in this topic is about um, whether there's sufficient focus on health in the adolescent years. And the reason for that is for three, three things. So in terms of um, what causes health inequalities, we know a lot about social causation. So um, the amount of um, material wealth in the home, the psychosocial situation in the home and parental behaviours, all of that can cause inequality later on. And that's social causation. Um, but there's also evidence around health selection, and that's about your health enabling you to select into education for future life chances. And there's lots of evidence that in the adolescent part of the life course, the evidence for health selection is as strong for social causation. So there's a dub double whammy for focusing on um, health in education, for health, later health itself, and also for enabling selection into education at a critical time in the child's education journey. 
The second reason for focusing on health in adolescence is because it's another period of brain development where a child's interaction with the environment starts to um, impact brain development in terms of regulating emotions and also cognitive control. And that happens um, just, just after puberty. And then also the other reason for focusing on the adolescent years is because we have stark and growing inequalities in health outcomes such as weight and mental health. So post COVID, um, across globally under 18s one in four with depression and anxiety that's much more um prevalent in uh, lower income families and then also uh, for obesity in england one in four children leave primary school at age 10 and 11 um obese and that's quite that's quite shocking really and again that's socially graded so lots to go at so that's my interest so what did i do i applied for a doctoral fellowship three years ago and i uh, put forward three questions that i wanted them to fund so i won't read them out to you because you can see them there but in sum what's the association between measures of child development or school readiness well, when children start school and their weight and mental health in adolescence and that was the component parts of school readiness so all those individual aspects of development to see which one was most strongly associated with later health then I also wanted to see um, what were the factors that explain that development health relationship, so mediators, and also what were the factors that may modify or moderate that relationship between development and health. Then moving beyond, um, moving beyond that, once children start school, I wanted to look at the period of development from age three to 14, and to look at at population level, whether there are groups of children following particular trajectories of development. And then could the, would it be possible to describe those groups in terms of their characteristics that you know where um, ethnicity socioeconomic factors schooling factors parental factors and then once i'd found those derived trajectories are those groups associated with overweight and mental Ill health at age 14 and 17. so i propose that i would answer those questions in three ways first doing a critical theory review around health inequalities literature then a participatory systematic review, and then finally some um, longitudinal analysis. So I'm just going to explain to you the findings of those. So I found three things in sum. I uh, produced a conceptual model of the development health relationship from age three to 14 um, in the context of socioeconomic circumstances. I found out which aspects of development are most associated with adolescent health. And I also discovered that there are trajectories of development in mid-childhood and what the impact of those trajectories are on weight and mental health. This hasn't come across so well because of uploading slides, so it doesn't look as good as it would look, but bear with. So the conceptual model is um, basically just showing that the, the relationship I was interested in is those two blue, uh, they come out as hex hexagons, I think, um, development and health. And the things, all the things in the bigger circle are things that we know from the evidence that can affect those things. So social determinants we've already spoke about, the circumstances that you're born into, the amount of stress in the home, the amount of material wealth in the home, the behaviours in the home. Then you've got the school environment. Then you've also got, um, from um, Amartya Sen's work, is got, you've got about the development of capabilities. So say in a country like the UK, everyone has access to education and health, but how does a child translate that access to schooling to um, the opportunities they might need to live the life they want to live, to quote Sen. So that's all about development of capabilities. So um, how is it that um, development translates into health? And um, so my research was trying to unpick some of that stuff. Then I took this conceptual model out to a group of stakeholders, teachers, public health practitioners, voluntary, um, voluntary sector workers, policy workers, and they put it brought in another circle which you can't tell in this uh, slide because animation doesn't work but they brought in very quickly that um political factors really are a massive influence on schools um that the the focus of the regulator on attainment makes it very difficult um to focus on some of the you know maybe more well-being type stuff that the the labeling culture of children isn't always helpful and that the current educational system can kind of stifle innovation. So they brought out some other things that they felt were actually quite important in this uh, development health translation in childhood. Um, okay, so that framework provided the framework for the, the systematic review. And as I've said, that was participatory in nature. So the whole time through the review, I was discussing the, what I was finding with this stakeholder group. 
But in sum, when you break down school readiness, the thing that's most associated with your later health as a teenager is your social and emotional well-being when you start school. That was really strongly associated with weight and mental health later on. The things that the literature found that explained that relationship was a child's self-esteem and their relationship with teachers and friends. The things that altered the relationship was the amount of chaos in the home and aspects of parenting. Um, good social and emotional well-being was also very strongly linked to better academic results as a teenager, and that was by, explained by a child's ability to pay attention and a positive approach to learning. Then the second aspect of development that was most strongly associated with later health was a child's cognitive ability. Then the other aspects of development, the physical development, language and communication, there was some evidence for those, but not as strong. So a child's social and emotional well-being and cognitive ability were the things that were mainly um, linked to better health in te as teenagers. That's just some of the outputs from that work, if anyone's interested. OK, so then um, I, moving on from that, I wanted to think about, OK, so we have children at this stage of development when they start school. What happens then? Are there particular trajectories of development at population level? So I wanted to be able to identify and describe those trajectories in mid-childhood and quantify whether they were associated with weight and mental health at those two ages, age 14 and 17. The measures that I used are there in the chart. You can, you can read them if you are interested. Um, just to say they were binary measures, so it wasn't continuous. So it basically was, does a child have problems with social and emotional well-being? Uh, do they have problems with their cognitive ability? Yes or no. So binary measures. Um, so... Yeah, that longitudinal analysis then is the first study to analyse social and emotional and cognitive well-being um, concurrently over time in children. And my hypothesis was that the interplay between cognitive ability and the social and emotional well-being that's conducive to optimise your cognitive ability may interact over time to influence your health in adolescence. Um, the method that I use is group-based multi-trajectory modelling, and I used it on the UK Millennium Cohort Study, which is a cohort of 20,000 children born in the UK in the year 2000, and it follows them up over time, and it's representative of the UK population. I won't bore you on the modelling technique, I'll just simplify it by saying that basically it allows you to reduce kind of complex longitudinal data by spotting by identifying patterns in um, in data and putting them into latent clusters. But if anyone's interested, I could explain that in a lot more detail. OK, so that's the longitudinal bit. So what did I find? I found that, yes, there are groups of children following similar trajectories of social and emotional and cognitive development. And there was four groups identified. Um, OK, so I'll just explain this chart so you stay with me. So the, the top four there, the top four charts, that's about social and emotional behavior problems. Lower is good, higher is bad. So higher means you know, more, um, more probability of problems. Then the chart below is about cognitive problems. Again, high is means problems, low means uh, less problems. So you can see that of the in the Millennium Cohort Study population, that 76% of children, so the blue lines, had no problems in either aspect of um, those behaviors, um, social and emotional or cognitive problems, no problems throughout the school years. And so that's 76%. Then the next cohort, one in 10 of the group, developed um, social and emotional problems in late childhood, um, but without any concurrent problems in cognitive ability. Then 8% of the cohort had problems in both cognitive and social and emotional problems in early childhood. So when they kind of started school from age kind of three to seven, but then went on a resolving trajectory. And then the final group, 5% or 1 in 20, had persistent problems in both those aspects of development throughout childhood. So that, that's the groups. So moving on, the, the coloured groups, the orange, yellow and red, I'm call, going to call them adverse trajectory groups. OK, and the blue group is the no problem group. So how do we interpret that? So a model spits out something like that. What, what does it mean? So in the UK, in, in England, certainly in primary school, most classes, there's about 30 children. So you would expect um, about one in four of those children to be on an adverse development tra trajectory throughout primary school. Three of them will develop problems in social and emotional behavior in late childhood. Two of them will have persistent problems throughout childhood. And two will be have early problems when they start school, but be on a resolving trajectory. Now, again, just to say that that's in a typical class. Obviously, what is typical, there's you know, different areas of deprivation that will be entirely different. So then what do those groups look like? Can we say what might make somebody more likely to be in an adverse development um, group? 
So using multinomial regression and comparing all those adverse groups to the null problem group, common risk factors for being in any of those adverse trajectory groups were being a boy, um, having family disadvantage, and I measured that by um, a mother's level of education and a mother's uh, mental health. Then you're also more likely to be in an adverse group if you live in a disadvantaged neighbourhood in terms of being in the most deprived quintile. So not some of the, uh, that wasn't graded so much, just the most deprived quintile. And then the other important factors were school factors around being bullied all the time and parents not being involved with the school. I have a lot more detail on what described um, the, the separate groups, but I think that's sufficient for today, just in terms of what, what the common risk factors were for all the adverse trajectory groups. So how do we interpret that? Well, I think there's something important there around disadvantage in that the closer it is to the child matters. So the family disadvantage, so the mother's education or a mother's mental health, were much stronger risk factors than neighbourhood disadvantage for children with late onset or persistent problems. But neighbourhood disadvantage was a very strong risk factor for children in the early problems group. So the implication of that finding is that it supports targeting early years services by uh, neighbourhood disadvantage, um, but it seems less important for children with persistent or late onset problems. Another important finding was in relation to minority ethnicity, so that's non-white minority ethnicity, and that was very strongly associated with being in the early problems group, and that you know, kind of seems relatively obvious, potentially and perhaps in terms of not having English as a first language at home, then getting support, going to school and catching up. Um, the implication of that finding is that it does support targeting children from minority ethnicities for early support on starting school. The other a positive thing here is that the resolving problems trajectory, so the children who start school doing not so good in social and emotional and cognitive problems, but on a, a improving trajectory, it shows that schools are getting early support right for some children. And when I spoke to some teachers and, and um, local authority colleagues about this, they were really happy about that finding and kind of wanted it um, kind of shouting about because, you know, people can be down on schools a lot, but I think there's something about our state education system doing something right for a lot of children and they catch up when they start school and that's a good thing okay then sorry just one second so then if you're on one of those um development trajectories is that what does that mean for your later health as a teenager so i looked at um, using logistic regression whether um, you were more likely to be overweight, obese, or have mental Ill health if you were in an adverse trajectory group compared to being in a no problem group. And the answer was yes for um, children who develop late onset problems, yes for children with persistent problems, but no for children with early problems and on a resolving trajectory. And again, I think that shows it's really positive. So for, for, for children who start school and are behind, and for whatever reason they catch up or start to do better, or they're on a positive path, that's good for their health as a teenager. So I think that's really positive. So if we could get some of the children on those other trajectories on that path, that's going to be very important for their health. So I also analyze these aspects of development separately, but I won't do that uh, go into that now because we don't have much time. But the main point, the main aspect of development that's driving the relationship with health is social and emotional development. So cognitive is important, yes, but social and emotional is the one that's driving the relationship. So back to our class of 30 children, what would you expect? So again, so we've got those seven children um, who, who, were, who were on those adverse development trajectories. We now have um, five of them, so one in six. That's going to be bad for their health as a teenager. So the late onset and the persistent problem groups, they're more likely to be overweight or obese or have mental ill health at age 14 and age 17. The children who are on the early and resolving trajectory, that's not associated with those adverse health outcomes. But it does, you can see there that throughout school, one in six having developmental problems, that's going to be a problem for their health as a teenager, and that may limit how well they can benefit their onward kind of educational journeys. So you could say, well, that whole development health relationship, Michelle, that's entirely because of somebody's social circumstances. So in the model, I did control for socioeconomic confounders and the relationship still exists and the odds are there if you're interested. So Yes, there are inequalities in children's development in mid-childhood, and that's going to be a problem for their health as teenagers. But the relationship between development and health does still exist, regardless of the socioeconomic inequality. 
So the overall interpretation is that development in mid-childhood is socially patterned and that has implications for later health. The relationship between development and health exists even after we account for disadvantage. Um, so that shows there's opportunities for development of capabilities and things like self-esteem and relationships which can improve the development health relationship. Uh, social and emotional development is the main aspect of development driving the relationship with teenage health. The timing of when problems emerge or when they resolve matters um, and it's important to observe for the late onset problems as described. So what does all that mean for policy? Well, I think it means that we do need to build on best start in life policies and within any um, health policy for child and adolescent health, we need to focus on social and emotional well-being and that should be a central area of focus. Uh, policy should also take into account that different factors drive early, late and persistent problems. Um, it should take into account that minority ethnicity and neighbourhood deprivation is very important for early years. So that's important for targeting. But family disadvantage is important throughout childhood and adolescence. And therefore, policy on both prevention and mitigation is needed. So prevention in terms of the socioeconomic factors and mitigation in terms of boosting the development health relationship when children are in school. Um, so very briefly, I won't read these out, but some things that, for example, schools can do, there's lots of stuff around becoming a health promoting school. Um, some schools in the northeast of England have taken action around poverty proofing settings, which is important currently in the UK because of the cost of living crisis. And um, there's clearly more that can be done around social and emotional well-being in school. Um, then for local authorities, it's about continuing that targeted early years support. Um, for at a national level for education and health, I think the main thing is that education and health uh, at a national level need to collaborate much more together because no education system is effective unless it places the well-being and health of children at its centre. So um, from, the, from the regulator's point of view, say for example Ofsted, that could maybe consider um, looking at aspects of social and emotional well-being in schools when it's rating and monitoring schools um, at a national level. The education system needs to consider whether resourcing of school is, is sufficient. We can see that with strikes in the UK currently around res resourcing, etc. And also to consider, you know, some of the questions I posed at the beginning, what exactly do we expect of the education system? If we do want the education system to try and break into generational inequality, then it needs to do, um, it may need to operate differently than it does now. Uh, for example, in terms of, uh, say, admissions criteria and how they operate, where you live and the amount of income in the home affects the type of school you're going to go to. That's a major break on um, social mobility. So there's work that the Sutton Trust and others have done looking at different kind of admissions policies and um, countries such as Chile are, are doing different things as well. And it's interesting to see the research coming out of there. Um, and then another thing that the certainly that the health sector could do is about working much more closely with the education sector to develop joint plans for enhancing social and emotional well-being in childhood. It definitely needs to link in obesity and mental health strategies to educational strategies as well. Um, and then a uh, cross government level, I mean, in the UK is one of four countries in the WHO Euro region that doesn't have a national child and adolescent health strategy. If you're interested, the other countries are Greece, Tajikistan and Slovenia. So we need to we need to catch up. Um, I think there needs to be much more collaborative work, as I've said, I think also at national level, there needs to be thought given to the time that a child is in school, that state individual individual interaction is a very long period and I think there could be more that could be done there for overall population health gain. And, and finally, certainly in the UK, the government needs to commit to levelling up plans where there's uh, targets around health literacy and numeracy for children. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. A few reflections um, on policy and a couple then and mainly those reflections are about how we bring a public health lens to um, decision making. So, for example, in 2020, when the government start, said it was going to end its kind of um, free, free meals to children in the summer after that first lockdown in COVID, and Marcus Rashford, a famous Manchester United footballer, started a campaign to get the government to turn around on that decision, and he was successful, which is great, and most people would be delighted with that. Um, but I think one of the things that it got me thinking of was, well, what was the decision making process in the first place that led to a decision not to feed uh, disadvantaged children? There's something quite, you know, very, I'm not sure what the value base is there. It's just very interesting. But the, 
making a decision like that, the government should have been able to stand next to it and defend it, and they couldn't. Um, so there's something about holding to account and, and bringing a much stronger public health lens to decision making. Then the other example, there's Jeremy Hunt, he's the Chancellor in the UK, and this week he um, brought out one of his initiatives to boost the economy in the UK and get parents back into work, and that was about extending free childcare to one-year-olds. So one-year-olds uh, would get 30 free hours at the age of one and two, rather than now it's from the age of three. And you could say, well, okay, that's great, but that needs to be considered in the full, what's fully known about the evidence around um, environments needed for young children. And a recent policy review showed that it's the um, environment in the family home that most kind of determines uh, children's development and um, early early years development when they start school. So if we're taking children out of those family environments and putting them into wherever else early years settings, you need to think exactly about what kind of environments they're in, or that could be very, it may not be as good as you might think for the future well-being of children. So there's something about... Um, is there a sufficient public health uh, focus on decision making at central level? And the answer is uh, no, and there probably needs to be. Um, you know, in a, we're in a time of economic crisis, so we're making decisions about the economy, um, and that's fine, but it might not necessarily be very good for um, public health. Um, a few personal reflections about the, me and doing a PhD and a fellowship. It takes significant time and effort to prepare a fellowship application, but it's usually uh, it's been hugely rewarding. I would say don't be afraid to contact the experts. You know, if you're really interested in a topic and you're reading, um, you're coming across the same authors all the time, get in touch with them. Um, I did, and they were more than happy to talk to me about what I was thinking of doing, and I'm still engaged with some of them now, so that's been really positive. I would say factor in as much participation and engagement with people working in the field and the general public as you can. That's not to tick a box, but it really does add a great deal of kind of depth to your research. And I would encourage people to share findings in many different ways, not just through presentations. Thanks very much for listening. Sorry, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. There was a lot to cram in there. If you're interested in the related publications, there's a list there. Thank you very much for listening.